During pupation in Drosophila, a complete structural reorganization occurs. All the adult structures develop from specific groups of cells in the larva. Pattern formation may be explained in terms of a gradient of developmental capacity. The cells in the center of each disk have a full potential, whilst cells at the periphery have a restricted development. Pattern formation in the slime mold polyspondylium appears to be simpler. The regular spacing between groups of fruiting bodies can be explained in terms of a biochemical gradient, a diffusing chemical. But more complex patterns of development, like neurulation, can't be explained in terms of gradients alone. They involve cell movement. In vertebrates, cells migrate to specific areas to form the nerve cord and backbone. So pattern formation here depends on cells responding to developmental instructions by movement. But how do cells move? In culture, most cells have an area of membrane which ruffles. As this region extends, new strong adhesions are made. The cell contracts. Weak adhesions at the back break, and the cell moves forward. But what determines the orientation of moving cells in developing tissue? Dr. Jonathan Bard, MRC, Edinburgh. The cells in the very early embryo, the blastula, the gastrula, bear little resemblance to those in the adult organism. But by about the time the tail bud stage of embryogenesis starts, cells begin to acquire their adult forms and their adult organization. In the section of the Xenopus clawed toad, for example, there are three sorts of cells. The immature cells surrounding the gut, Epithelial monolayer cells, such as the skin surrounding the embryo and the neural tube. And there are mesenchymal cells, which comprise the somites and the notochord. There are also neural crest cells, which are an ambivalent sort of cell because they normally form mesenchyme, but they can form an epithelium. And these are wandering, moving cells that take up positions all over the embryo as they move away from the neural tube. These processes of morphogenesis are extremely difficult to investigate for two reasons. First, the embryo is very small. And second, the events take place inside opaque tissue and are therefore very hard to follow. If we wish to get some understanding of how cells form tissue organization, we have to make use of those particularly rare examples where we can escape these confines. And perhaps the best known of these is the cornea. Now, in the three, four-day-old chick, the eye is a surprisingly large proportion of the whole size of the embryo. The cornea is on the outside of the eye, and it's large enough us to study and to find out exactly how the cells cooperate to build it. In a section of the front of the three-day eye, the most obvious feature is the lens. And on either side of this are the tips of the retina. The cornea is the thin epithelial sheet on top of the lens. And what marks it out from any other epithelium is that it is producing a thin layer of collagen between itself and the lens. Now, between the retina and the cornea are the neural crest cells. These cells migrate in between the lens and the cornea. Initially, they move as individuals, but eventually they join up to form a confluent monolayer, a single cell layer, which adheres to the underside of the cornea. Now, how do these cells know that they must form a monolayer, only one cell thick? Now, the mechanism by which this happens is known as contact inhibition of movement. And this is a mechanism which is shown by cells in culture. When they touch, the active ruffling membranes which cause them to move 
stop. The cells become passive. Another part of the cell membrane starts to ruffle and the cells move away. The significance of contact inhibition is that it demonstrates that cells, rather than migrate over one another, will migrate away from one another. In the cornea, contact inhibition of movement would stop cells migrating over one another and force them to become a monolayer. Now, not all cells show contact inhibition of movement, and we can't assume that the neural crest cells do here. Is there another possibility whereby these cells can form a monolayer? Think about the geometry of the tissue. There's very little space between the lens and the corneal epithelium. And maybe there's only sufficient space for a single cell layer to form, so that it is the geometry of the tissue that is controlling morphogenesis. So think what would happen if I were to remove the lens just before the neural crest cells were set to migrate. Removal of the lens is an extremely delicate operation. By carefully cutting into the eye, the lens can be removed without damaging the cornea. After the lens has been removed, the front of the eye can be cut away and transferred to a millipore filter paper for culturing. Once the front of the eye has been removed and placed on the millipore, we can culture it for as long as we like and then look at it. If we look at it immediately in the scanning microscope, it can be seen that no cells have moved out across the cornea. However, a few hours later, there has been considerable migration. A few hours after that, the cornea is covered by almost a monolayer of cells. And this is about the point at which development would stop in the normal eye. However, in these cultured eyes with their lenses missing, the migration does not stop now, but the cells continue to pile out from between the retina and the cornea to form a multilayer of endothelial cells which even migrate around towards the back of the lip of the retina, somewhere they would never normally go. Had contact inhibition of movement been the mechanism for making the monolayer, we should still have had a monolayer. Since we don't, and we have the multilayering, it must have been the geometric organization of the tissue which had imposed organization on the cells. So in this case, at least, we know that it is not the intrinsic ability of the cells that is responsible for tissue formation, but their environment. The formation of the endothelium is not the only event in corneal morphogenesis which arises through the migration of cells. Two days later, after the anterior chamber has formed between the lens and the cornea, uh, there is a further migration of cells from the neural crest to the periphery of the cornea. These cells are held up until the cornea swells. The stroma of the cornea, the region between the endothelium and the epithelium, swells as a chemical called hyaluronic acid is pumped into it by the endothelium. This chemical absorbs water and forces the two cell layers apart. When this happens, the neural crest cells, which have been held up at the side of the eye, migrate in and colonize this tissue. Initially, they migrate in from all points around the eye and they take up a radial organization where cells normally point in from the outside towards the center. 
Within two or three days, however, this organization has completely changed and the cells take up positions along the north-south, east-west axes. They are what is called an orthogonal organization. Two questions arise from this. First, what is the stimulus for the movement? And second, what causes the cells to change their organization? The answer to the first question is trivial. The availability of more space. When the stroma swells, there is room for the cells to migrate in, which was not present when the cornea was condensed. The answer to the question about why the cells change their organization once they have invaded the cornea is more complex. And it depends upon cells using a new property called contact guidance. The best known example of this is shown by cells uh, near glass fibers. The cells uh, adhere to the glass fibers, align and move along them. But the same phenomenon is also shown by cells which adhere to the protein collagen. Contact guidance is the ability of cells to recognize geometric features in their environment and to align along them. Collagen is found in the corneal stroma. The epithelium lays down collagen bundles in the form of something like a three-dimensional tennis racket. Once the fibroblasts have invaded the cornea, they lay down more collagen, strengthen the bundles, which in turn become robust enough to support fibroblast movement and the fibroblasts align along them. The mechanism then by which the fibroblasts change the organization is again a geometric one. Cells recognize features in the environment which constrain them and force them to take up the orthogonal organization. So in some cases, cells become orientated by the geometry of the developing tissue. In other cases, however, it's the surface properties of cells which determine the correct positioning. Professor Mel Steinberg, Princeton University. These shish kebabs illustrate a trick we used uh, in our efforts to understand the mechanisms by which cells and tissues take up their correct positions in the body as the embryo develops. We took glass fibers uh, pulled out very fine and skewered bits of various embryonic tissues two at a time on these fibers. And then we took the whole assembly, put it into tissue culture medium and left it there overnight to see how these bits of tissues attached to one another uh, would behave. In the morning, the shish was removed, the kebabs were put back into culture, and uh, we gave the tissues time to begin their rearrangements. As this rearrangement process continued, we discovered that always a specific one of these two tissues would spread over the other one, and it was never the other way around. So when, for example, we mixed a bit of retina and a bit of heart, it was always the retina that spread over the heart, never the other way. Heart, on the other hand, would spread over a fragment of precartilage from the limb bud of an embryo until the heart had enveloped the limb bud completely. And in general, we found when making combinations between a variety of tissues from chick embryos, that the tissues could all be arranged in such a sequence so that each tissue, let's say to the left, would spread over any of the tissues uh, to the right. There was a single unitarian hierarchy in terms of spreading tendency, much like a pecking order in which one individual can peck any individual uh, below him, but none of them above him. And what that meant here was that regardless of the various chemical differences that must, of course, distinguish the different tissues of an embryo, there must be some single principle that governed which tissue would spread over which other tissue when those two would come into contact. We came to a better understanding of how these configurations come to be generated through a study of cell sorting. What one does is to take tissues from embryos and now dissociate these tissues into their component cells. This is done with a solution of an enzyme that causes the cells to separate from one another. One can mix these cells together and cause the cells to come back together into common aggregates so that one has synthesized now
tissue fragments which contain cells of at least two different kinds all mixed together artificially. The cells move about and as they encounter others of their own kind, they trade partners of the other kind for partners of their own kind. And by this process being repeated, the cells progressively come to sort themselves out. How can one explain the forming of a constant configuration by cells that start out in different configurations, either mixed up in the one case or put together as intact uh, pieces of tissue in another? They both come to the same final configuration. How can that work? Well, in nature, there exists a system already well known and studied and understood, which does exactly the same thing. And this is the system of immiscible liquids. If one takes oil and water, and here I've put some dye in the water so that you can see them, oil and water, and shakes them together, comparable to a cell mixing experiment, the oil and the water will separate out. What has caused the oil and the water to separate from one another? The answer lies in the intensities of adhesion between the molecules. Oil sticks to oil and water sticks to water, stronger than oil sticks to water. And so the molecules have gone into that configuration in which they're held most tightly. That requires the oil and the water to separate even though they've been stirred together. Uh, one can demonstrate this also with a drop of colored water and a glass slide on which some grease has been put. When placed on the greased side of the slide, it quickly moves to the wettable or non-greased side. It can work exactly the same way with cells. In order for cells to sort out then, cells of one kind and cells of the other kind ought to adhere to one another more strongly than do the cells of one kind to the other kind. We can actually measure these cohesive forces by taking aggregates of cells from different tissues, um, putting them into a centrifuge and centrifuging them for a long period of time against a surface to which they do not adhere. Then an aggregate which is very cohesive will remain quite round. An aggregate which is very weakly cohesive will be very much flattened by the centrifugal force. And by comparing these uh, shapes, one can determine which of a pair of aggregates is more cohesive. This was done with aggregates whose sorting out and spreading behavior was already known. And it turned out that in every single case, the aggregate that would take up the internal position when uh, sorting out was completed or when spreading was completed was the aggregate which was rounder at the end of a period of centrifugation, showing that it is the more cohesive aggregate that goes to the inside, takes up the internal position. One can demonstrate this very nicely with computer models. In this case, one has squares which represent cells, all put together into a larger square which represents an aggregate. And one can start with two such aggregates, side by side, touch them together, and the computer uh, is instructed to allow cells to move one at a time and choose which of two positions they prefer on the basis of the strengths of adhesion that have been assigned to the cells of one type, of the other type, or to the boundary between cells of two types. Just as in the case of living aggregates, the squares of one type migrate round the other, spreading over the surface, eventually enveloping the other. But the program's flexible, and by changing the values of the parameters, other situations can be modeled. Here, model tissue aggregates of different sizes have been put together, and the values for distances between cells altered. Again, the spreading phenomenon takes place. The aggregate, which has been assigned the highest level of adhesiveness, takes up the internal position, while the less adhesive aggregate starts to spread. In order to make this work, it's necessary to assign the values of adhesiveness such that the two systems would be immiscible. If one assigns values of adhesiveness that are incorrect, then the two squares will all mix together in time instead of sorting out.
or spreading one over the surface of the other. In the computer model, just as in the case of the living aggregates, it is always the more cohesive cell population that takes up the internal position and the less cohesive cell population that envelops it, spreads around the outside. It would seem then that the structure of a tissue or organ uh, is programmed as follows. The individual cells are coded with adhesive properties which differ from one cell to another and even from one part of a cell surface to another part of the same cell surface. These cells act like, like jigsaw puzzle pieces, except that the coding, instead of being in the shape of the edges, is in the adhesive properties of the edges of the cell. When cells of different kinds encounter one another then, they're mobile, they test out the different uh, adhesive possibilities, and they go into those positions in which they're held most tightly. This process goes on over and over again, not only between cells and other cells, but between cells and extracellular substances, such as the collagen and other materials found in the intercellular spaces. In time, as weaker bonds give way and stronger bonds are made, the configuration of the tissue as a whole drifts into the configuration that is programmed, as it were, uh, through these adhesive differentials. And that configuration is the desired configuration, the anatomically proper or correct, the natural configuration. Embryonic kidney is composed of tubes of epithelial cells embedded in a three-dimensional matrix of fibroblasts. If the kidney is disaggregated, cells will sort themselves out into their original pattern. So sorting out not only applies to whole tissues, but to different cell types within a tissue. But what's the difference between the cells that ensure sorting out will occur? Here, fibroblasts are plated on top of others. They adhere to the cell surface and spread rapidly. Epithelial cells plated on fibroblasts also spread rapidly. But fibroblasts on top of epithelial cells show a different behavior. These cells are still dancing on top of the cell sheet 10 hours after being introduced, unable to spread. Epithelial cells refuse to plate on top of a spread epithelium. This single cell moves around on top of the sheet, unable to spread. Eventually, it finds a gap, adheres to the plastic, and spread. Let's look at that again. The cell refuses to spread on epithelium, but spreads on plastic. Clearly, there's something special about one surface of an epithelium. Embryologically, this means that once one side of an epithelium adheres, it can only make adhesions at its edges. In the kidney, this implies that epithelium cells form tubes whose inside surface is free from other cells. 